arm. Arm is the assistive robotic manipulator. Oh, it's not my competition. Arm microcontroller. No, no, no. Oh. We've, heard, we've heard that we're joke. So sorry. I was starting off not like it. We're so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't rebuild it. No. I'm Angel. This is Brendan, Robert, and Harris, and this is our advisor, Professor Peter Allen. And uh, let's jump right into the project. So the key thing that we were looking at when we saw, oh, let's make, let's try and solve some problem goal was to make something assistive to help to help disabled people. Uh, people who are paralyzed, either partially paralyzed or fully paralyzed, are often bound to a wheelchair, and because they don't have full mobility, they don't have the ability to go and uh, pick up a piece of food on the table or to brush your teeth or similar simple tasks. And so we thought, okay, how can we fix that? And that's why we decided to make. Uh, the Columbia arm, which is, as you can see here, a wheelchair mounted and robotic arm. Um, some of the key metrics we were looking at is how can we help people uh, fill activities of daily living, which we'll go into more later. How can we use some new technologies to make that task easier, more intuitive, and cheaper? Right. So expanding on the activities you of daily living. Yes. 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 So the activities of daily living include things like uh, taking yeah. your medication, uh, brushing your teeth, combing your hair, and feeding yourself. Right, things that are we're dependent on to live on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of the people who are confined to wheelchairs have human assistance to do that. So we figured if we can build a robotic arm to take care of some of these activities of daily living, we'll make people more independent and we'll reduce the time that they need uh, to depend on a human assistant or maybe even completely get rid of the need for a human assistant. Um, so that's why we set out to build a robotic arm that can be mounted onto a wheelchair and assist people. Um, so some of the key features that we built in were the brain-computer interface, right, which is what I'm wearing on my head, and that's what Robert will tell you. So the main reason we looked into a, <laughs> the main reason we looked into a brain-computer interface is because we realized that people who are paralyzed or have limited mobility don't really have the ability to manipulate joysticks, which are traditionally used to control robot arms. As a result of that, just strapping on a research $20,000 robot arm to the side of the wheelchair simply wouldn't work. We have to find something. <laughs> We have to find. We had to find something that would solve that problem. For us, VCI was a great solution because it can be done with almost no mobility. The way uh, the VCI system we're using works is it's an off-the-shelf product from Motive. It's 14 separate sensors that sample the uh, potential differences across the different parts of the sensor. And we have two different types of readings we can get from it. We can look at the locations of the particular signals, and that's called electromyography. It's used to track muscle signals. Uh, because it's an environment, and we'd like you to be able to try some of this too, that's the system we're using now. The other system we're, uh, we're also looking into using in the future is EEG, or uh, the electroencephalogram, which actually reads what you're thinking of by doing a Fourier transform on the brain. But this is EEG, right? It's EEG. It can do both EEG. 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 So we're doing EMG now because we'd like you to be able to play it out. Are you storing your points in something? Yeah, exactly. Facial exactly. 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 <laughs> So some other key features that we implemented were uh, to keep it inexpensive, right? Low-cost manufacturing. Uh, this includes laser cutting and 3D printing. Uh, these are technologies that are readily available at Columbia, and we made extensive use of them. If you look at our robot arm, all the parts have been lasered. Yeah. What Everything. tool did you use to design this? Uh, it's Perlin E. Or now it's Creo, right? Um, so everything was designed with Creo, and that's Creo. You get the puzzle pieces that all fit together. Uh, the laser cut. And the great thing about the laser cutter is if we need to redesign something or if something breaks, we can have a new part in less than five minutes at a very, very low cost. Uh, another thing is a series of elastic actuators. What this is is putting an elastic material between your actuator and your rigid body. So when the robot collides with something, it absorbs the impact and doesn't hurt the outside. Uh, environment for itself. Right? Well, there's a word for that. What yes. is that word? Compliance. Compliance. Yes. Yes. It, and it's actually built into the mechanics of it as opposed to software. Right? So we could build in software compliance, but we have the advantage of, you know, of exactly, avoiding the collision at the minute. And on top of that, when we're talking about using BCI as an interface, there's usually a little bit more latency than just controlling a joystick, and it is admittedly a little bit finicky. So having compliance and hardware is really, really important. Because when we're talking about putting this in a domestic environment, especially with someone who is paralyzed, 
anything that's going to run into someone, it could be really, really dangerous. That's not something that you just spot on. Thank you. Um, so just a quick touch on what we did here, like how the series last of actually doesn't manifest itself. Um, we have this tubing, which is where we get our elasticity. Um, and the way this works is that there's a pulley, uh, there's an inside pulley that is driven by cable transmission, um, and then there's an outside pulley which is then connected to the rest of the arm. And the intermediary between the two is this tubing between the two. So the one that is driven by the cable will rotate, which in turn provides torsion on this, and then that torsion is what applies a force to the rest of the arm, hmm. which is really cool because A, it gives us compliance, B, if we measure uh, both the displacement of the inside pulley and the outside pulley, we can also calculate force control mm -hmm. via Hooke's Law. Now, the Hooke's Law, how stable is that over time? Um, that's actually something we are thinking about. Um, yeah. The way the design works is actually pretty easy. It's just kind of like a hole and you yeah. slide the elastic component and it's very easy to yeah. take out and put back in. Um, and so that's something we envision. So you could kind of have to do it. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's going to be a repeated exactly refreshing process. Exactly. But over time, you could chart this and map it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, so far, it's been fine for us. But right now, we're running out of time. So we're going to demo for you guys. Okay, yeah, so yeah. Demo. I'm going to yeah. demo. All right. And I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about the arm as we demo. So right now, what's going to happen is he's controlling the bottom joints, right? The, the big joints over here. And basically, that like is global positioning. That gets us in the vicinity of where we want to be. And then I have control of the rotation here and opening and closing of the clock. So we can try to pick up the water box. Yeah. Uh, so if you'll notice, um, as we designed the robot, we thought we want to make this modular so that we can now allow somebody to purchase different parts of the arm for different prices. So for example, so um, what, is this, what are you doing to make it happen? So when I move my eyebrows up, it opens the claw. When I clench my teeth, it closes the claw. And if I smirk to the right, it rotates uh, counterclockwise. Smirk to the left. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, so no problem. Um, so we wanted to have a modular design, as I was saying. So for example, we have three, three stages really. Uh, you can have the first three degrees of freedom here, which is basically the wrist. One, two, three. Um, or you can add a, a, a fourth and a fifth for a five degree of freedom system. You can mount that on a, on a, the side of a wheelchair. Um, or you can have a seven degree of freedom system. We couldn't bring our last two degrees of freedom because they wouldn't fit uh, with travel. Um, but th those are actually mounted to a mobile base. So instead of a wheelchair, you can also mount that to a mobile base. Would one of you like to give this a try? Yes, I would. Okay. Go ahead. Are you having trouble with this? Because these tend to be pretty um, finicky. Yeah, we've actually we've been working clenching well. and eyebrows are probably two of the cleanest. Yeah. They're very reliable. So as long as this is touching this bone between your ear and you have these above your eyebrows. Yeah. Yeah. Over the course of today, maybe 10 or 15 people have tried it on and only one person has worked. There we go. Looks like right now. Oh, oh maybe step yeah. a little yeah. close. So there is some reference, but there are two hard level reference posts that go on. Right. Yeah, it should go in your bone. Bone dead. Nice. Well, the thing with these arms, usually they can be, you know, 20 to 400 grand. Uh, but we wanted to make something inexpensive. Uh, so our goal, our target was 6,000 and we got the 3,200. You got what? We, this our target was $6,000 for a budget and we got the 3,200. And the reason being, um, when you talk about an arm like this, maybe try most people that are going to be using it are disabled and therefore unemployed and therefore their insurance is... Uh, you can't expect them to pay that much. Right. Their insurance is probably going to be Medicare. We want which something affordable. We'll usually give them about $10,000 for things like this, which would include like an electric wheelchair. Um, and you can get electric wheelchairs for about like 5000 So what we wanted to do was say, if you have a $10,000 budget and a lot, maybe 5000 to an electric wheelchair, and then 5000 to an arm. And since we were actually able to go under that budget, um, we were thinking about maybe making a move to polycarb instead of the wood, um, which would increase the stability and performance. Um, it would be a little bit more expensive, but we actually have budget to spare, which is really great. You know, another thing we can improve on is our gripper. Our gripper is nice, we got it from Willow Garage. Again, off the shelf components. But as you can see, there's a bit of a moment arm here. There's a bit of a heavy lead screw. Um, also, although the arm itself can lift about two to three kilograms, the gripper the gripper can only lift one kilogram. So we would we want to maybe work on getting a better match. Yeah, yeah. Eyebrows. 
It's actually only 10 bit, but we're oversampling and adding, a, adding in a bit of random data. So we get about 12 bits of actual data from it, which corresponds to a half degree of accuracy. And under our current control loop, we have uh, very consistent results. Um, at least we've never had any trouble with getting it to go to, going up. So is this open source or is there something we need to do? Yeah, we love that. about that. So right now, the primary control systems, like the drivers for the motors, the PID control, have been open source on GitHub. But the thing that we're concerned about is the VCI interface we're using um, links against some of the some of the motives and the libraries we use to get the data. And those currently require a license, so we don't know if we can open source that. Now, what I do plan to do over the summer, though, is figure out if I can reverse engineer some of the protocol. There's been a lot of work done by a and see if we can get the same same data and the same values from the open source versions of the closed source version. Didn't Berkeley do a bunch of open source stuff? They do. Part of the issue isn't the different processing, it's because the transmission from the uh, device to the USB is AES encrypted. And the key is technically under processing or something. Um, but the magic number has been found, so I think at this point it's really a question of whether we can work with legalities, not so much a question. So what do you think the board for? So the board is running everything except for yeah, because we have got a free TV. <laughs> and so we need a test section for my laptop to answer. So what do you mean by it? So this is so doing it, your data, uh, data gathering and doing your data so here we've got PWM motor controllers, okay. which uh, take in signals from USB and then convert it to voltage to get to the motors. The control loops are all running entirely on here, so that's a torque control loop, a velocity control, and a position control. On top of that, we run trajectory control, which lets us say, um, when we have all seven degrees of freedom, <laughs> specify a pose for the end, the end effector, and it finds its own way to it and avoids all the obstacles in between. It is also running the brain control software, which interprets the signals coming from the motor device and converts into commands given to the motors themselves. And in the future, we plan to add in perception, so say a connect, perhaps a magic right here, which would let us um, have the entire thing be automated, so we can say, okay, pick up the block labeled B, and it picks it up and brings it back to you. And that's just an application of uh, inverse kinematics, which we've already written. And the we have already. So. Is this all in software or processor This is all running on the Atom board right now. A little bit of the BCI is run through the, some of the DSP processing stuff. But we are not currently using the FPGA because it doesn't seem particularly effective for the type of processing we're trying to do. But well, it's not effective. Um, the only thing it seems to make more effective, at least in my testing, is the fast Fourier transform. And that is not the limiting factor in our, our current processing. The limiting factor is the rate at which data is sent from the amount of epoch to the board, which is about five hertz. Yeah, because you've got your, because you've got a lot of your data collecting is going on over here, and then you've got a transmission, correct? Um, yes and no. So up here, the data collection is being done on this board right here. That's because this entire upper part of the arm is its own modular piece and can be removed to make its own arm. The lower parts, um, each individual one runs through its own, own PWM chip, and that's being controlled in red from directly on the atom board. Okay. And that's so we can add an arbitrary number of extra joints here. And one of the plans we're thinking about doing uh, when we continue this project is to make separate segments which include a fully controlled motor like this and a power, a power distribution for it. So you can just 
like adding segments together make it bigger and bigger lock. But you also need more here, right? Well, these are for the precision manipulators. So we only need these at the end effector. Everything else is position the end effector more effectively, right? Or more closer to the object being manipulated. So when we're adding additional degrees of freedom, it's more important to add the large degrees of freedom because any error can be accounted for with the more precise drawings. Oh. Hmm. So you don't need the same number of uh, actuators as we, no, we don't. have independent. And that's very important for us because an entire actuator system using one of these motors costs about $120 because the motors themselves are low cost and we're using our own feedback control system. Whereas the Dynamix and MX64s are $300 each. And so we want to limit the use of them as much as possible. And how about uh, calibration? How do you so our calibration is currently being run by using the same type of potentiometer on every single joint. That way we can calibrate one joint per angle. Oh, okay. And then using our knowledge of the gear ratios, that calibration applies to the rest of the system. For PID control, because we know that there will be different loads on the end effector, and we can't make a perfect PID minute. system, we are one instead minute. running the control loop um, over here we're running the control loop at 100 Hz because maintaining the position here is very important. As we go further back, the control loop slows down because it takes SS processing power that's necessary. So by the time it gets to the seventh joint, we're running at 25 Hz. And that's still sufficient to maintain all the angles we need to get. How big is this market? Very, very big. Um, well, hopefully very big. There's millions of disabled people worldwide. Mil actually, millions in America. Yeah. Um, the only thing is, uh, and we went to the Columbia University Medical Center to talk about right. what it would be like to actually implement this. So a lot of the features we implemented were from the chairman of the uh, Department for Regenerative and Rehabilitative uh, Medicine at Columbia University Medical Center. Uh, and so the things that we got from him were like, you know, control. He said, no joystick. That's why these $20,000 or even $40,000 like arms don't sell. Right? One, they're expensive, but two, why would you pay if you can't control it? Uh, making it lightweight, and then the cost, obviously, with the big. You guys had too much fun on 